There are nine well-established hallmarks of aging, but what's less established is the impact of microbes. So why would I expect that microbes can affect the hallmarks of aging? So in terms of the total number of cells in the human body, human cells are outnumbered by the amount of bacterial cells. So we can see that uh, data here. So when looking at the total number of human cells for the reference man and reference woman uh, that are young, 20 to 30 years old, we can see that the total number of bacterial cells in the human body outnumbers human cells by 1.3 fold in the reference man and 2.2 fold in the reference woman. So there's more bacterial cells than human cells in young men and women. Now this is also true whether it's a young infant that's four weeks old or one year old and in older adults that are 66 years old which in this case would have uh, 1.8 fold more bacterial cells than human cells. And it's also true in obese subjects uh, who have 1.4 fold more bacterial cells than human cells in the human body. So when considering that we're more bacterial than human in terms of cells and that the total number of bacterial genes in the human body outnumbers human genes by more than 100 to 1, uh, based on that data, I would expect that microbes can affect the hallmarks of aging. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. My microbial products affect the hallmarks of aging. In particular, I'm going to focus on mitochondrial dysfunction. So in order to talk about mitochondrial dysfunction, it's important to talk about mitochondrial function. What is mitochondrial function? So just as a brief overview of that, uh, mitochondria, uh, uh, their main function is to, to produce energy in the form of ATP, but also as a byproduct of that process, they produce superoxide. So what we're looking at is a uh, cartoon of the mitochondrial inner membrane where the electron transport complexes are, which is uh, the, where ATP synthesis occurs as, as a result of uh, their actions. So just briefly, uh, oxidation of NADH and FADH2 uh, starts the biochemical and electrical process that culminates uh, in the production of ATP by the ATP sy uh, synthase uh, with ATP production in the mitochondrial matrix. Now, as a byproduct of this process, as I mentioned, electrons can leak uh, and uh, be picked up by oxygen, thereby forming the uh, toxic reactive oxygen species uh, superoxide. Now, as I'm going to show in a few slides, uh, fortunately for us, um, we're able to detoxify the relatively toxic superoxide uh, into the less toxic but still toxic H2O2 hydrogen peroxide by manganese superoxide dismutase, MNSOD, and then that H2O2 is further degraded by an enzyme called catalase into water and oxygen. And uh, again, I'm going to talk more about the catalase story in a few slides. So what happens to mitochondrial energy and superoxide production during aging, uh, thereby identifying mitochondrial dysfunction as a hallmark of aging? So mitochondrial function uh, declines during aging. So uh, in this cartoon, we're looking at uh, young versus old. And uh, more, in, uh, more specifically, we're going to zoom in on the muscle uh, in both young and old uh, people. So if we further zoom in and go to, down to the level of the mitochondria in muscle cells, and even more specifically to the mitochondrial matrix, we can see that the young mitochondria are characterized by relatively high levels of energy production in the form of ATP and relatively low levels of reactive oxygen species production, superoxide. In contrast, the old mitochondria produce less ATP, less energy, and produce more superoxide. So, uh, that mitochondrial fun again, that mitochondrial function declines during aging. This is well established. That's why it's a hallmark of aging. But again, what's less discussed is that the microbial product, lipopolysaccharide, increases during aging and that it negatively impacts mitochondrial function. So uh, let's jump into that data. So what's LPS? And I, uh, I've introduced this briefly in another video. So if you missed that, uh, uh, you can check it out there or uh, stay here so that we can go through it just a little bit. So uh, uh, the lipopolysaccharide, LPS, is found in gram-negative bacteria. Uh, so not all bacteria are the same. Some are identified through a gram-negative stain and others are identified through a gram-positive stain. So LPS are found in gram-negative bacteria. So if we zoom in on the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, we can see LPS, which is a metabolite that's found in the outer wall or the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. So uh, blood levels of lipopolysaccharide increase during aging. So first, this is data in mice, and we've got plasma levels of endotoxin, which is just another word for lipopolysaccharide or LPS. So plasma LPS on the y-axis uh, plotted against young mice, YM, and adult mice, AM. And what we can see is that there's a, a, an age-related increase in LPS in the blood in mice. Uh, and just a just, uh, you know, for a brief, uh, you know, uh, these are these were four-month-old mice, which is uh, equivalent to teenagers uh, in people, 
and 18 month old mice, uh, which is equivalent to about being middle aged. So they compared uh, circulating LPS values basically in teenagers versus middle aged. Significant increase in the blood. All right, this, this effect has also been found in rats. Uh, and this is in data that's in a preprint from earlier this year. Uh, young versus aged rats, we can again see uh, significantly increased levels of LPS in the blood during aging. So where's the, uh, the obvious answer is, uh, or question is, where's LPS co even coming from? How's it even getting into the blood? So let's go th through that real quick. So first, LPS can translocate from the gut into the blood. So 99% of the human microbiome is found in the gut, and um, much of that is uh, contained with, within gram-negative bacteria. So much of the LPS that's found in the human body is found in the gut. So in the, in the situation where there's good intestinal barrier function, um, the tight junctions that connect intestinal epithelial cells are intact, which then limits the ability of stuff to go from the intestinal lumen into the blood. However, in the situation where there is intestinal barrier dysfunction or poor gut barrier function, the uh, tight junctions that connect the intestinal epi epithelial cells uh, are weakened or degraded um, uh, and more leaky. And uh, accordingly, stuff that's in the lumen, whether it's whole bacteria or bacterial products like lipopolysaccharide or bacterial or other metabolites uh, or uh, bacterial vesicles uh, can translocate from the gut lumen into the bloodstream. Hence, that's one way how LPS can get from the gut into the blood. Alternatively, there is indeed a, gut, a, a blood microbiome, and that's what's shown here. This is data in young subjects that were 21 years old. So um, we can see that most of the blood micro, microbiome composition in the uh, circle is red. So the red is uh, proteobacteria. Now, proteobacteria is a gram-negative bacteria. So in other words, 83% uh, of the blood microbiome is LPS containing. Now, there aren't any large, very large studies in older adults that have com compared the blood microbiome versus the, in old versus young, but it's possible that the uh, levels of proteobacteria that are found in young at, at an already relatively high level, 83% of all bacteria being proteobacteria, it's possible that they further increase in abundance as a potential explanation for having more LPS in the blood during aging. So that's, those are two ways how we can get more LPS in the blood during aging. So I showed you the data in, in, in rodents for age-related increases in LPS. What about in humans? Uh, so first looking at, again, plasma levels of endo endotoxin, which is another name for LPS, in young versus older adult uh, people. In this case, this was 26 years old, uh, 26 year olds versus 74 year, year olds. We can again see a significant increase in LPS in the blood of the older adults. Now this is a small study, you know, 13 young and, and 12 older, so total sample size 25, it's relatively small. Uh, data from larger studies uh, can can add more strength if it's a real effect or not. So uh, again, in a preprint, so the this study has not undergone peer review, but it's been published online. Uh, this is data for uh, 1,100 more than 1,100 people and how uh, plasma levels of L LPS change during aging. And what we can see is that when compared to around 20 year olds, LPS significantly increase. Uh, for 60 or 60 year olds. So being older than 60, there were significantly higher levels of LPS when compared to the younger adults, the 20 year, 20 year olds. Now, uh, what about older than, you know, about 75 or 80, which is the upper limit of this graph? So what about in centenarians? So one would expect that centenarians, just by virtue of being alive uh, for 100 years, they'd have the even higher levels of LPS. But in fact, there's one study that has looked at this and they found the opposite. So centenarians actually have lower levels of blood uh, LPS versus healthy young controls, and that's what's shown here. So, you know, just quickly, two two reasons why that could be is, you know, survivor bias. So that they get to 100 years old, they're healthier, uh, you know, than the the those that died before them who may have had poor gut barrier function or alterations in their blood microbiome. Nonetheless, it suggests uh, potentially good gut barrier function and no age-related alterations in their blood microbiome as at least two potential explanations for why centenarians would have lower levels of LPS in the blood. So uh, the, the purpose of this video is how do microbial products affect one of the hallmarks of aging, mitochondrial function. So let's have a look at that data. So first there's decreased mitochondrial AT ATP production in the presence of LPS. So we're looking at the ATP to ADP ratio, which is a measure of uh, uh, AT, ATP production, so energy production. So this is energy production by macrophages. So uh, first what we can see is uh, when compared to uh, the control macrophages that were not treated with LPS 
versus the LPS treated macrophages, there's a decrease in ATP production uh, in the presence of LPS. Now these are in whole macrophages, so that doesn't indicate whether it's coming from mitochondrial ATP production or other sources in the cell that can produce ATP. So to address that, the authors of this study added oligomycin. So what does that do? So in looking at our uh, scheme of the mitochondrial electron, electron transport chain again, uh, oligomycin inhibits the ATP synthase, complex 5, of the mitochondrial electron transport chain, which produces ATP. So by adding oligomycin, you're inhibiting mitochondrial ATP production. So any ATP production that remained after adding oligomycin is the amount of cellular ATP that was produced but was not produced by the mitochondria. So when you look at those amounts, we can see that the remaining amount is similar after uh, LPS, which suggests that the amount that ATP production decreased in the presence of LPS was com almost completely mitochondrial, a, a, a defect in mitochondria. So LPS negatively affected the mitochondrial ATP production. That's what the oligomycin data helps clarify. So what about ROS production, reactive oxygen species production? So um, first we're looking at um, mitochondrial superoxide production. So in this study, they added a mitochondria specific uh, 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 dye that got, gets into the mitochondria and that binds to superoxide. And what they saw was uh, in the presence of LPS, there were higher levels of superoxide as a result. So um, superoxide is one measure of reactive oxygen species. Another is hydrogen peroxide as an in, a less direct measure of superoxide production as superoxide is converted into H2O2 hydrogen peroxide. So uh, in this case, again, we're looking at macrophages and uh, hours after exposure to LPS. So 2, 6, and 24 hours after uh, macrophages were exposed to LPS, what were the cellular hydrogen peroxide levels, H2O2? And what we can see is uh, that there is a dramatic increase in cellular H2O2 production in the presence of LPS in, uh, in macrophages that were exposed to LPS. Now, again, this is cellular, and it doesn't tell you about how much of the contribution uh, to the total hydrogen peroxide pool was coming from the mitochondria. So to address that, the authors of this study uh, overexpressed catalase in the mitochondria. Even though it's found in the mitochondria, they increased the levels of catalase in the mitochondria. And if you remember from an earlier slide, catalase degrades hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen as shown with the reaction map under the, under the graph. So any H2O2 that remained in the MCAT um, macrophages, so overexpressing uh, catalase in the mitochondria containing macrophages, that would be the HCO2 that was coming from non-mitochondrial sources. So what we can see is that in, at every uh, uh, time point, 2, 6, and 24 hours, the vast majority of the H2O2 production was coming from mitochondria. There is some small amount that was non-mitochondrial at the 24-hour point, but we can see that there was a massive decrease in the amount in response to the uh, catalase. So again, this this uh, it demonstrates that most of the H2O2 that was produced by macrophages was in uh, mitochondrial in response to being exposed to LPS. So increased mitochondrial ROS production in the presence of LPS. So as a quick summary, uh, so mitochondria the func uh, uh, function declines during aging, which is that why it's a hallmark of aging. Uh, LPS increases during aging, and high amounts negatively affect mitochondrial function. So uh, what I did mention is that the, in these studies that have looked at uh, LPS on mitochondrial ATP production and on uh, reactive oxygen species production, they used levels of LPS that are 500 to 1,000 fold uh, times greater than what's been shown in people, especially during aging. So the big question is, would physio more physiologically relevant levels of LPS impair mitochondrial function, especially in uh, the aged? And there, there's no data to support that yet, but I'd argue that based on the data that I presented, it's possible that LPS and maybe even other microbial uh, products can negatively affect uh, mitochondrial function. Uh, and yeah, again, no studies have explored this yet, so stay tuned. All right, that's uh, all I've got for now. You can find me lots of places online. Have a great day.